and I'm really pleased to welcome uh, Gitini Murungi, who's a recent Engineering for Change uh, fellow through the Autodesk Foundation uh, program, and also uh, an individual who's very deeply um, engaged in the startup world and, help, and who helps uh, startup businesses uh, you know, develop innovative solutions. And Kitini is joining us to share his experience of running collaborative product design and development projects. And we will hear a really interesting case study about developing a training program for a Kickstart team, which includes defining the required skills, uh, leveraging digital tools to uh, drive collaboration and deploying the solutions into tangible output, which in this case, uh, the example we will hear was a solar pump electronics design, and hence why we asked that poll question. Um, Thank you, Katinia, for joining us this morning. Uh, and I'm really happy that you're here. We're slightly delayed on the agenda, I said, but we'll move with your presentation as we had planned. Um, and I would like to hand it over now to you to take us through uh, your session. And I believe that your audio is on mute, just so for awareness. It looks like it's still on mute. Uh, hello. Yes, now it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Um, glad to be here with you today, and I hope you can hear me. So let me share my screen quickly so that I can jump straight into the presentation. Um, kindly confirm that you can see my screen. We can see the screen, and we can also hear you. Oh. Okay, uh, it's loading. Yes, I believe it's still loading. Um, so I uh, don't know why it's taking time to load. Sorry for that. Uh, yeah. So I think it has been uh, introduced and uh, have been flowing through the entire discussion. And uh, something that I've realized is uh, everything is kind of building up from one presenter into the other. And that is uh, something that um, I can highly commend of what this uh, uh, camp is all about. It's all about building skill sets and trying to connect and showing how different things connect one another. And as to that point, I'll be looking into specifically the topic of choice today is the future of collaborative uh, product design and development in specifically in Africa, because this case study was done in Africa and uh, some based on many teams, one tool. And I think uh, the presenters who have come before me have actually tried to uh, brought closer and closer what many teams mean because we've seen mechanical engineers, we've seen electrical engineers, we've seen chemical, we've seen financials, we've seen so many people working uh, around Autodesk uh, Fusion 360. And that is where the concept of many teams and one tool comes in. And um, just to show you how it all started, this uh, discussion started with um, my fellowship at uh, Engineering for Change. So for those ones who don't know what Engineering for Change is, uh, I'll be sharing maybe more details uh, to this, as well as uh, how Engineering for Change partners with other partners as well as sponsors into building workforce. So they have three, um, key areas that they focus in. Number one is a building workforce uh, around uh, research, purely research projects. Number two is uh, uh, building a workforce around uh, design for good. And number three is building workforce around uh, advancing workflows. So I was uh, a fellow in the, uh, in the third category, which is uh, advancing workflows. And uh, my partner was Kickstart Foundation here in Kenya, a company that uh, has its headquarters in San Francisco. And uh, Autodesk Foundation was my sponsor. And uh, what I was tasked to do in a duration of five, which spanned to five, six months, is a development of a solar pump electronics design. Uh, not only that, but now couple that as a use case for training, uh, for internal training purposes of Kickstart uh, design team. And uh, this uh, kind of ties to our theme today, which is uh, to offer insights on the key trends 
that are driving digital skill development today and in the future. And uh, while I was trying to see the kind of thematic areas where I fall uh, based on this discussion is that I realized that I have two main thematic areas. Number one is digital skills development in Africa today and in future. And number two is best practices sharing through test projects and case study. That is uh, the thematic areas that I'll be uh, covering. Straight into our agenda today. So I'll be looking into the project scope, basically what uh, I was supposed to work on uh, with uh, Kickstart and uh, what were my deliverables. And then number two, I'll be looking into the project scope planning. Now, once I got into this project, like any other engineer, like any other project manager, how do you start planning around this project? Because now this is no longer a design project. This is no longer a research project. This is advancing workflow project, which kind of touches more into research design for good and uh, processes around it and building processes around whatever you, you are supposed to design. And number three, I look into the program design and development techniques. What are some of the things that I deployed uh, through iterative processes and found it actually working? What are these techniques? And then number four, we look into the pro, um, project or uh, output and outcome. And number five, I'll make, uh, um, I'll look into challenges and also make recommendation, especially now that we have people here who are building skill set in an African continent, as well as people who are in the industry, but also need to build a, a skill set to the industrial kind of uh, workforce. Uh, jumping straight into, um, Sorry about that. Jumping straight into uh, the discussion here is uh, we can see that um, the dramatic area, our sponsor, and what exactly was supposed to do uh, development of a solar pump electronics use case. And uh, there, there are three key deliverables that I was supposed to work on. Number one is uh, to improve. This is like the outcome to improve the Kickstart design team capacity on electronics design. Number two, of course, the way to improve people's uh, capacity uh, in most cases, especially in these kind of hardcore uh, skills is actually by designing or rather by building an actual solution around it. And for us, we were to build, a, uh, we were to design a back boost converter and then now tie all that into a case to be used for internal training programs. And uh, the kind of skill set that we uh, the, the program was looking after is uh, software design, specifically Ego, uh, which is now coupled into Autodesk Fusion 360, or rather an alternative to that, uh, either Proteus or, or any other software that will maybe ease some of the concept around this. And I'll also mention why I'd put Proteus there among other that are available. And uh, other areas around hardware is uh, how do you build now circuit design, you simulate them, you assemble, you test, and all these now, not only from the circuit level, but also from uh, uh, basically PCBs. And then working around solar systems. And as you can see, we are building solar pump electronics. And uh, this actually tells you uh the kind of things that our uh, kickstart actually does and number three is um working around ic's this is uh microcontrollers among other things and most importantly teaching or rather training or facilitating and looking into that uh of course the first thing in 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 any uh, planning project or other program is to do a survey similar to what we've done here and i can see it's it's not really uh, different, especially looking at uh, what kind of uh, general skill set in electronics design are there. And this is the kind of demographics that I had. I had one person who is an electronics engineer uh, in the team, a lady, of course. And uh, the other four members that I had is uh, two of them uh, were technicians. One of them is a manager who has a mechanical background and uh, another one is a senior engineer who has a mechanical background. So, and uh, the other two technicians had also mechanical background. So the kind of demographics you can see here kind of now uh, uh, mimics the kind of people that I was supposed to work with. And also their, uh, their level of expertise in Fusion 360 also changes because when you look at electronics design and you look at what the, the level of Fusion, 60, Fusion 360, 
kind of expertise, kind of changes. And this also tells you now that these are a group of people that kind of are familiar with the design, but not in the electronics domain, but also uh, in, when you come into the electronics domain, they are not as good as maybe the way uh, it would make this kind of a process be eased or rather uh, make it easier for you maybe to just roll on and keep moving. And for that, this is the scope that was given. And then I was now, uh, of course, customize it and come up with something that really fits the team. As you can see, uh, allow me just to go back here. When you look at these kind of uh, demographics here, you can't just design one thing fit for all because you have um, an electronics engineer in the team, which means that uh, when you design some basic things, this person might feel on board. Uh, but again, when you design complex stuff uh, and maybe you start in a, in a very complex level or intermediate level, you're more likely to lose uh, the entire team, which is actually built by mechanical engineers. And for you to balance that, you need to balance everything. And uh, I'll keep on saying balance, integrate and collaborate and partner, feedback, iterate, among other words that I'll be using. And uh, with planning now, it comes at a point where now we, we were able now to get uh, ourselves rolling with the design and development of this kind of, uh, we'll call it curriculum, course outline, and then also designs, uh, trying uh, what works and what doesn't work, among other things. By the end of the day, we ended up uh, having um, a couple of sessions, uh, almost over 20 virtual sessions. But... Remember, this program was designed in a way that uh, all I was supposed to do is just engage virtually. But uh, as we all know, and uh, as people who have done electronics design, especially when you are training new people uh, in these hardcore skills, virtual may not actually be uh, everything that you may uh, leverage on. You may leverage on, especially when now you are at a different level where uh, both you as the trainer and the trainee, or rather you as the facilitator and the other side of the, 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 uh, the, the, the table, where now the rest of the team is, kind of understands their deliverables and kind of understand everything that is required of them. And at that particular point, that is where now the other two things came in physical meetups and then industrial visits. All these were not there initially, but they came in as, as a reason uh, of now making this program as effective and as customizable as possible to this particular team. And uh, by, by uh, the end of uh, five months, uh, we had, of course, our final design uh, on Fusion, uh, designed on Fusion 360. But how did all this happen? Of course, capacity building um, encompasses a lot of things. And this is now where I'll be looking into the techniques that I saw important, especially to any person who is building a capacity, uh, who is building skill set, who is building skills in a workforce that is either remote, physical, in a company setup, or rather in even in uh, an academia setting. Number one is uh, you need to connect because virtual isn't enough, especially for this kind of community, especially the industry. Uh, community. As you, as I had earlier mentioned, I had two technicians, I had one uh, senior mechanical engineer, and I had one manager. All these people had mechanical background. So at some point, just connecting with them virtually and having to having to pump all this content uh, uh, to them may not actually build uh, that kind of skill set that you might expect. And at that particular point, I had now to start looking at things differently. Uh, that is where now I, the first thing I'll recommend, especially in capacity building is connect. Connect to the kind of uh, workforce, co connect to the kind of audience that you are targeting. And well, after doing that, then it, it might be easy now to move to the second step. The second step is of course, to start with the basics. I realized that after having a discussion um, with the electronics engineer and also the manager, all these people had a clear understanding of where we wanted to go. But bringing in the rest of the team, it was kind of very, very hard for them because all of them had mechanical background and they are coming in and I'm starting to mention things like electronics and this kind of actually drifted their attention. Not only drifting their attention, but when we start to tell them now, our future of the company is that we are looking into 
internet of things now that even confused them further and uh, that comes to tell you that however much you think your scope is big or your scope is small or maybe your time is limited you may think you may rethink again and actually consider starting from the basic and even if these basics will take you uh, some time it will actually be worth it because when you build a solid foundation into anything that you are working on, then it becomes very, very easy for you to proceed to the next level and you proceed with everyone uh, on board with you. Then from there, I realized something else very, very important is, uh, of course, there is no way people can actually build expertise with you pumping content to them, especially in this kind of design environment. People need to design, people need to demonstrate, and people need actually to uh, do things on their own, whether they have the capacity, whether they have the machines, whether they have whatever, uh, the, 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 whatever the constraints are, they need actually to do things on their own so that uh, they can build these kind of competencies and they can shed off uh, quote unquote fear of any uh, of these tools that they are using. And after that, uh, be flexible with tools when necessary. Uh, at some point, we reached a place where uh, some of the, the, the uh, maybe the, uh, the, the modules that we needed, maybe to, for a simulation were not available in uh, Autodesk Fusion. And for us to showcase this kind of uh, a skill, or rather if there is a concept that I needed to demonstrate and it's not yet there in Fusion 360, don't feel attached to a tool, especially in a training concept. Of course, you know, the design that you want to build is in Fusion 360, but at some point for just demonstration purposes, you might tend to tweak a little bit and bring in something so that the, 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 the concept is home. That is why I had to, recommend this again be flexible with the tools when necessary again this is not entire duration but when especially when necessary um and something else that i realized that was not there during our initial setup is that there was no kind of hands-on physical session especially where now we were supposed to to start building uh these pcbs and before we reached at the pcb level there was no plan uh, initially on how we could uh, start to touch on breadboards and uh, strip boards before we even go to chemical etching and uh, we end up in the uh, industrial kind of a uh, PCB manufacturing. This goes to tell you that at some point be as visual and not only as visual but also as tangible as possible. Why is this important? Uh, as you realize engineers and especially people who are who are used into working in the world of physical kind of uh, uh, things, they tend to appreciate things that they can see. And that's why fusion electronics is very, very important in making it visual. You can build uh, designs, you can put any kind of colors that you want, and you can actually simulate it to the point that you think this is a real thing uh, or rather it has been uh, taken a photograph outside and then it has modeled in a 3D, but actually that is a 3D design and it is not yet even there in a physical world. But also you need now to move from that point to making it tangible. Uh, either in a mechanical setup, you will of course do 3D printing. In an electrical uh, and electronic setup, you'll think of now building small kind of uh, tangible stuff using breadboard or moving further into strip board and moving further into chemical etching, especially with these kind of small circuits. Why is this important? This is important because these people, uh, and especially uh, I'll keep on mentioning mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, their training grounds are not similar. And uh, what seemed to be obvious to a mechanical engineer, it's not obvious to an electronics engineer. And for me to bridge that gap, I had to bring in a concept here of making it visual and tangible at the same time so that the team would actually appreciate what we are building. When we are simulating it into the Fusion 360 and they could see those graphs, now you bring it in the, uh, in the actual world and at some point maybe they realize they are not getting the ideal results which they were getting in the Fusion 360 environment and then questions start to poke. Why is this not happening the way we were simulating? And then things like uh, tolerance in uh, electronics components, uh, defects in electronics components, uh, manufacturer, among other things now start to poke 
uh, start to come up at that particular point. And something else is uh, you need to build an holistic approach. Of course, going to YouTube, watching how electronics are manufactured in China can be very fancy and very easy. And everyone maybe can build that picture in their head. But having a partner, uh, especially an industrial partner where you can go and make them see and actually feel uh, that kind of environment is 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 a priceless kind of uh, uh, exposure and uh, experience that uh, such a team requires. These are, remember these are people who are used into seeing uh, mechanical kind of stuff happen, but they have never been in an electronics setup. And you're bringing them in into building that kind of a skills, and it's always important. If there is such a facility in your area, I know these facilities are there in South Africa, they're there in Nigeria. We have a couple here in Kenya, especially uh, for us, we partnered with Gearbox so that they can go and explore and see how things happen. And for that case, it was actually very, very, very helpful into us being able to, to kind of build that holistic approach into them actually uh, appreciating why we were choosing whatever we are choosing at the design level and the development level. And um, at that, uh, these are my pointers. The challenges that I, I faced here is, uh, of course, moving, removing someone from a mechanical, purely mechanical uh, technician or rather uh, mechanical engineering background and bringing them into electronics, uh, that, that, that does not actually require intelligence kind of shift but it also requires mind shift, mindset shift, uh, because uh, uh, this is really, really, really hard. And especially when someone has been in that field for, 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 for more than even five decades, then it becomes really, really hard to condition them to see things the way electronics engineers actually see it. And then number two is diverse skill set. Uh, and this goes to any uh, trainer, this goes to any facilitator, this goes to any person who looks into developing skill set in any classroom setting, quote unquote. You will realize that you will always have people who, who are good in visuals, you have people who are good in uh, designing, but also you have people who are good in maths, and you need to put into consideration all these. And number three was workflow is equivalent or rather is, is equals to process, which which means that uh, in an electronics kind of uh, manufacturing process, we call it process because you need to do things in a systematic order so that you can get a certain output. Uh, similarly, while we were doing these trainings, we I was required to build a, a, a certain processes around it so that it can be adopted. So that whoever goes through the same program or whoever goes through the same kind of a process, they are guaranteed of a specific outcome or output at the end of the day. Uh, number four challenge is a building a kind of a concession between the online and practical kind of environment. Uh, uh, but more importantly, bringing in the theoretical and practical concept in a physical and a virtual world. So that building that quote unquote combo was not something easy. Number five challenge that I, uh, I saw here is uh, remember, when you are in any project, and uh, this goes to any project manager or any uh, 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 program manager here, is that you have set deadlines, set deliverables, and set timelines that you're supposed to deliver. And remember, this is a new team which requires a kind of iteration. And iterations, the more iterations you have, the more time you are adding into the kind of deliverables that you're supposed to, to build. And by the end of the day, the scope kind of keep on increasing, which by the end of that kind of duration, you might end up compromising on qualities. So these challenges can, the way I recommend here is find a balance and integrate things. So if there is something that you can integrate even in the initial discussion or initial training, it can actually add value as you keep on going to the next level. And number two is uh, constant and regular feedback is actually what saves the day, especially where you are doing industrial kind of training, not just for the purpose of passing exam or just for the purpose of just sharing the knowledge and that's it. And iterate, 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 however hard it may seem to be, this is for the purpose of sustainability, replicability, and also scalability. The, how do they scale this knowledge that they have, the application knowledge that they have to the next level? And maintain scope, 
but create a bigger picture. Whenever the scope has been set, maintain that scope, however small or big it is, maintain that scope, but always create a bigger picture uh, of whatever you are doing. And lastly, connect, communicate, and emphasize. Remember, these are people who are coming in from a different background, from a different mindset. So you need to connect with them first, communicate everything that needs to be done uh, and make everything clear from the word go. And most importantly is to empathize with them. Don't sympathize with them. Uh, as I like to say this, don't sympathize, but always empathize with them. And when you do this, uh, the kind of uh, skills that, are, that you are building, the kind of uh, plan that you have in your workforce, then it will be as effective and as successful as you would want it to be. That's uh, my uh, presentation and uh, welcome question, feedback, or uh, anything that you feel uh, comfortable sharing with me in regard to this uh, presentation. Thank you very much.